Hey folks, welcome to Between Awesome and Disaster. This is Will Carey, your host. Thank you guys again for tuning in. I appreciate you being here. Uh, we're going to keep it succinct uh, today because we got an interesting episode to get to. Uh, on the show today, comedian Brad Hagen. Brad Hagen I've known uh, for a number of years from doing comedy in New York City. I also see him pretty regularly because when my fiance uh, can't go to a soccer game, I have season tickets for New York City Football Club because she gets them for me every Christmas because I am too fucking lucky. <laughs> um, Brad is one of the few comedians I know who uh, who enjoys soccer as well. So me and Brad often end up uh, sitting next to each other uh, in Yankee Stadium uh, watching a lot of uh, watching soccer and just kind of talking. And we and then I realized he had never done the podcast. So uh, I invited him over and I we got into some really interesting, uh, really interesting uh, territory. Um, he had mentioned this a couple of times when in conversation, but I never really asked him about it in detail. But he was raised in the Mormon church, which is something I know very little about. And he talks about his experiences growing up in the Mormon church and then being a stand-up comedian in New York City. It's a really interesting uh, story, and it gets into a lot of kind of thoughts of that. My kind of back and forth on religion in my life and where I'm at now. So it's a pretty, uh, it's an interesting chat, and I'm I'm looking forward to sharing with you. If you enjoy this uh, podcast, feel free to tell your friends. We're on iTunes and Stitcher. You can subscribe, add us to your faves list or leave a review, I would greatly appreciate it and helps uh, helps spread the word. And uh, thank you guys again for being here. Uh, You can follow me on Twitter, at ComicWillCarry, and uh, I'm going to have my website uh, redone soon, so I'll have some more more visuals to show you as opposed to just hearing my silky, buttery, smooth voice. (laughs) Uh, But thank you guys again for being here, and let's go to my chat with uh, my buddy, comedian Brad Hagen. I feel like California is a state built for Instagram. Yeah. Like the entire, oh, yeah. Yeah. The entire state's economy. When Instagram came out, the entire state was like, oh, okay, good. Yeah. That and like all the, like everyone at the gym there, like, the, yeah, mm-hmm. just the way everyone acts, it's built for like, this isn't just for me. I'm sharing this. I need yeah. people to see what I'm doing. I've been to, I've been to San Francisco, but I, I'm, I don't know about you. I've, I, I don't know why, but like Southern California, as wonder, as beautiful as it looks, has never, I've never really been drawn to want to live there mm-hmm. or spend like a, an inordinate amount of time there. I'm just always been like New York East Coast kind of focused. Yeah, I've only been to LA and just it was in and out real quick. And mm-hmm. yeah, I had no desire to go back. And I was not, I had no, nothing there was like, ooh, I want to live here. Uh huh. Yeah, I didn't feel like that at all. It's too big. Yeah. Is that an East Coast thing also? Like, Maybe, cause I feel yeah, like, just cause, born and raised. Because like, trees, we want trees. Right, because you and I are not from the exact same place, but I feel like the same like quadrant of the United mm-hmm. States. There's, yeah, there's, I, I don't want to live out the rest of my life where I'm from, but yeah, I kind of like trees and water. Yeah, and curvy roads. Right. And it's weird, <laughs> like driving on straight roads for too long. When we had, I had a, I went to L.A., for a sister, one of my sisters was getting married, and when his family was in uh, New Hampshire for like one, we had they had wedding stuff there too. Mm-hmm. A bunch of his family got car sick like first day because they like, couldn't handle it. It was oh, just really? like, yeah, yeah. Just first off, it's so closed in. All the mm-hmm. trees like give like a claustrophobic feel. And right. you're just winding around. If you know roads. Like in your hometown, you drive super fast, and it just freaks everyone else out. Right, right, it was right. Great. It was like, welcome <laughs> to New Hampshire, guys. Yeah, yeah, because you're from you're from New Hampshire. Now, I I feel like most people talk about Boston or they talk about Maine or Con- Connecticut, other mm-hmm. parts of New England, but I never hear anybody really speak at length about New Hampshire. So, what was your experience <laughs> growing up there, Brad? Uh, nice, beautiful, I guess. I don't know. I came from a big family. So it was like, uh-huh. like thinking about my, when I think about my childhood, it's usually like real positive memories, but also it's partly because I was just like forgotten by my parents because I was three of six kids. Uh huh. So it was like, I was able to do whatever I wanted and like I just spent, I like ran around in the woods. Like I was able to ride my bike anywhere. There's like no crime or anything like that. You don't have to mm-hmm. worry about anything. 
but I was also given like zero direction from my parents right. about anything. I just found out uh, like a year or two ago because uh, I asked them because uh, I, I something one of the few things I excelled at as a child was I was a really good goalie in soccer uh-huh. because I had an older sister who was a very good goalie, but she was like two years older than me. So like that's all like and no one else to play soccer with. So we would just like mm-hmm. take turns shooting on goal against each other for hours on end. Yeah. And so I got very like to the point where I was like probably like eight or nine. And that's the only position I played in like rec soccer. Mm hmm. My parents never even noticed I was good at all. And then I just stopped playing youth sports altogether. Mm-hmm. And for a while, like, I remember every year I'd get mad because I, back then, there was no like online sign up for youth sports. You had to physically was like, go there. Yeah. It was like a one night every fall or winter or whatever. It would be like, yeah, yeah. you have to, your parents have to go to the school, to the cafeteria and sign you up. And I'd go home with the flyer saying like, hey, here's the sign up, blah, blah, blah. I'd tell my mom I wanted to do it. And then like five months later, I'd go to school and everyone else would be talking about what teams they're on. And I'd be uh-huh. like, huh, I don't think I'm on a team. Weird, mom. <laughs> and I always thought it's because my mom like just forgot. She had a lot of kids, a lot of stuff to do. And then sure. I found out around Christmas, uh, I think two Christmases ago, I brought up to my dad and he was like, oh, no, uh, mom didn't forget to sign you up. We had a talk and decided we were done watching you kids play sports. And just had, they were they checked out on new sports by the time I was eight, right. which is ridiculous because they had six kids. So after watching the first two for a while, they're like, These, uh-huh. "This is terrible," and just decided our happiness didn't matter. They wanted Saturday mornings to themselves. So I was like, oh, "Okay, thanks, guys." I they, thought you were just being forgetful. You were just being neglectful. That's much better, <laughs> much better. Oh man, so yeah, because I feel it. Se- that seems to be the pattern is that you're really hands on with the first kid, but like by the time you get to like second, third. Oh yeah, or fifth and sixth are just kind of like, yeah. Could you just like not bother me? And 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 dying would bother me. So definitely don't do that. But then by the time they got to the sixth, like all of a sudden, when like the youngest daughter Camille was around like seven years old, probably they're all of a sudden they're like, oh wait, this is our last kid. Uh-huh. And then they just went crazy, putting so much time and energy. All of a sudden, she was on swim team year round, uh-huh. going to practice at like six a.m. and stuff. And I was like, "When did what? You guys are in there?" And they were spending like their Saturday, whole Saturday afternoons at swim meets. My dad became like an official and started right. officiating swim meets all over New England. And I was like, "Wow, you guys! Well, when you want to put your effort in, you got it. Uh-huh. There you go." Yeah, that's like the, that's sort of like you know the the children who are like had parents who are like of the like you know like the 60s and 70s they're sort of like kind of real hard ass and and Mm -hmm. and and something that i i think a lot of it is masking fear is that you're just you were just maybe like afraid of like what was going to happen or Mm -hmm. or you were going to get hurt and not be able to work and then and then you're not bringing in any money and that's how it manifests itself is trying to like not show your kids fear but then when they have kids uh, you're they you're they get this like big teddy bear version of your parents and you're just mm-hmm. like motherfucker yeah yeah no I kidding didn't get that <laughs> that makes sense that you're a goalkeeper because of all of the positions in sports that I think that could be uh, analogous to the stand up comedian I feel like soccer goalie <laughs> is the closest because you're alone. Uh, angry yeah, when yeah. you have to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, whenever you have to work, it's not your fault. It's and and else's. and if it, and if it doesn't go well, you're going to blame the people closest to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, exactly. I I was a I was a goal. They would let me play goalie when we were like four or five mm-hmm. goals up. Oh, uh, nice. Otherwise, I was a defender. But I never. I would always like make really good saves. Oh. And I was also not above like a bunch of kids fighting for the ball and just diving in and grabbing the ball. Oh, there you go. Yeah, um, see, I was not... I was still tiny, but somehow... I don't know how I was... I was just, I don't know, very springy, I guess. Then I was playing. It wasn't exactly, like, high-end. People weren't putting in the top corner in sure. rec league when you're nine. Yeah, it's yeah. so e- hard. Ex- ex- exactly. So you, you were like the... Who, who's the guy who plays for Real Salt Lake? Nick uh, Ramundo something? Uh, uh, that does sound familiar, yeah. Yeah, because he yeah. kind of has like an unusual like cat-like style. Oh, like, not yeah. Like watching him save penalty kicks, he's just like a cat going like, ah. I like uh-huh. that. Yeah, just launch. Oh, man. This has been weird. The uh, per, Have you been keeping up with the De Gea, De, uh, David De Gea stuff? No, he's what's been, going on he's there? He's been... He's had three, last four games. He's made three mistakes that have just let goals in. Like and and it's weird. I don't know how they do soccer stats now, because like who is keeping 
like how do they decide when it's his mistake that leads to it and not just right. like you know a good shot and stuff like that because yeah uh, so they, su- that's so subjective yeah and they were like so three out of his last four games he's made a mistake that let a goal in and it was uh before that it was three in his previous like 120 games he did that, Jeez. which is crazy. Maybe he's got trouble at home. If something's going I, on, it's, well, then they get that. they get shook up. It's like a big confidence thing. Oh yeah. So it's kind of like, do they? And they're trying to. They have like contract stuff going on with him. So it's, mm-hmm. do they sit him right now for? They have Romero, who's the Argent Argentine keeper, I think. Yeah, mm-hmm. or was he had he has like over seventy five caps, I think. Sure. So it was like, do we? Do they bench him and put this other guy in, which could only hurt De Gea's confidence even more or do yeah, they yeah. do they keep him out there and just watch it get worse and worse and then they're in Europa <laughs> yeah ex- exactly I always like like because I was at the I was at Yankee Stadium for the infamous uh 7-0 thrashing by the Red oh. Bulls Ooh. I didn't I didn't leave early I was staying the whole time that was Frank Lampard's first game of that season that was Jack Harrison's first game for New York City That's and sick and about the time the fifth and sixth goals were going in, and, and you know, Red Bulls, uh, of course, just having a field day and everyone's <laughs> laughing at us. Um, but, like, oh, just the look of, uh, just the look on Josh Saunders' face. He's like, I hope I have a job after yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, one bad game. Do you, you have really good seats. Are there any away fans near you? Uh, very, very rarely. Yeah, I was going to say. There have been a couple of occasions during, especially during the Red Bull, when the Red Bulls come, hmm. where there have, I've been Red Bulls fans sitting sitting near me, but it's I've never had any any trouble. Is it mostly season tickets around you? Mostly, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, like that entire line that that we sit in when you when you come with mm-hmm. me is usually season tickets. Oh, those tickets are so nice. Yeah, and I love that when I love that I have I it, you're like one of like two two or three people that I go to when I when when my fiance can't make it. Oh, nice. Yeah, I just looked at the schedule actually, and saw they're playing uh, L.A. Galaxy. A week from Saturday, but it's in uh-huh. LA, and I didn't. Yeah. I hit up my buddy. I was like, "Hey, you want to get uh, Galaxy NYC tickets? We're gonna. Uh, it'd be cool to see Zlatan." And he was like, "Yeah, sure. We'll just fly to LA and see." The-. I was like, "Oh yeah, good catch. I'm an idiot. I didn't even think about that." Did they play? Have they played yet in New York, LA? They did, but the Zlatan was was Zlatan had not joined yet. Yeah, it was yeah. a couple games before he did and scored that ridiculous. Goal yeah, oh, from, that was such a good introduction. Goal from halfway up the <laughs> yeah. field. Oh yeah, he was uh-huh. like, hey, I, I like the MLS. Yeah, I could do okay here. Yeah, so soccer was early on for you. Um, so what were your what did your parents do that they were checked out by the time you were around? Well, my mom just raised a bunch, I say just, but like raised a bunch of kids. Uh-huh. And then, well, also when I was a kid, she had like uh, a side, not multiple side jobs, but she had one side job she would sew uh-huh. for a woman who lived like 20 minutes away, which when I was like five was forever, whatever, like once a week she'd have to drive out to this woman's house to drop off like everything she sewed that week. And I would just uh-huh. be like, oh, 20 minutes in the car, that's my life. Right. Uh, there goes my whole Wednesday. But she would uh, sew potholders like uh, together. Oh, like okay. from the you know like how they have the sewing patterns that are like the crinkly paper. Sure. And you sew everything together. So she would make hundreds of those basically, and just like mm-hmm. garbage bags full. And then I don't know. And I would I have very clear memories, very young of a, I would rip off all the the paper backing from all the uh-huh. fabric. That was like my job. Right, right. Yeah. And then they just yeah. end up in like an antique shop somewhere in Portsmouth. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> that, it seems like that woman had an Etsy page before there was the internet. So I don't know gotcha. what she was doing. Yeah. She yeah. had she she had proto Etsy. She was her own Etsy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My uh, dad is a soft has been in software sales my whole life. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Like so he what, like jumped around. Of... Large, large print software. Basically, like I would uh-huh. explain my dad's job to kids in middle school. And it, like it sounds like he was like undercover like cia or something it sounds so fake and made up it's like right out of true lies like oh, right. he's a software salesman large format yeah he travels a lot blah, blah, mm. blah. yeah that just sounds like one of those kinds of jobs that like it, it obviously exists because someone has has mm-hmm. to do it but there are certain jobs that you you listen to someone describe their job and like you know if anyone figures out a more efficient way to make that happen i, I don't know what you're gonna do yeah, yeah bro. you're you're, out, you're in trouble uh-huh. my dad's got it set now because he like he worked for a few different companies, but this last one has been. I think he hit twenty years last year. They had like a thing. He's like near retirement age, but I don't think he's going to retire because mm-hmm. now he's reached the point in his sales where it's 
it's, you have he all doesn't the have to, Yeah, he doesn't have to like do anything. He basically like he'll hit me up uh, when he's on these business trips because he'll fly. He'll just go to like conferences and stuff wherever there's big meetings. But he doesn't like work in a booth. He'll just that's yeah. where his clients are. So like he'll go to Vegas and just rent a pack of motorcycles, and then him and his clients just like ride Harleys out to Hoover Dam and back. And he's like, yeah, that's my job. Like that's what I did today. <laughs> Wow. Well, yeah. I think I guess if you put the the time in, you want to enjoy it a yeah. little bit. That's something. And one of six. How many brothers and sisters? Four sisters, one brother. Four sisters, one brother. Yeah, yeah. How how is that? Uh, I don't like. I don't, I don't know. Something I've been trying to figure out whether I was good. I'm not sure what effect all my sisters really had on me because mm-hmm. I'm still kind of terrified of women. <laughs> so I think they probably had something to do with that. Uh. And my little brother's even worse. Like, he is legit. Like, he's in his mid-20s. He's also very Mormon still. So I think right. I think that might have more to do with it than my sister's, where it's like the whole time you're going through puberty and all that, women, like, all of the thoughts you have about women are evil and from the devil. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, would, it makes them scary. When they're, like, when they can jeopardize your eternal soul, it kind of makes them more into, like, a, a, a temptation than a human being. Right, you never just got to have a platonic friendship with a woman and like go and dig holes in in the and be amongst the trees. Yeah, this is something I'm curious about because you've brought it up when we're sitting at Yankee Stadium a couple of times, and I never knew how to ask you. you were you ra- Is your family Mormon or were you just? Yeah, yeah, my family. I was raised Mormon. Yeah, yeah. You're raised Mormon in New Hampshire. Yeah. Are there a lot of Mormons in New Hampshire? Because I know near Maryland there's a big Mormon church, but I oh, didn't that's the know temple, yeah, the, the, DC, the Mormon temple, which yeah, is in DC. Yeah, I've seen it from the Beltway. Yeah, yeah. Like, when you wow. turn the corner on the Beltway, and it's all lit up. It's like it's funny once you leave the Mormon church, uh, uh, all like the hypocrisy you see, and like one of them, I saw, I read a great meme that someone put. It was like a picture of that temple, mm-hmm. and it was like the cost of lighting it per year and like how right. many how many poor people that could t- like feed and uh-huh. it was like yeah but the church isn't going to do that right they're going to build huge temples and, and light them so is there a big mormon community in, in new hampshire when you grew yeah, up yeah well kind of standard for like east coast uh-huh. uh like the west coast is crazy with mormons right. right they're everywhere uh we had one meeting house for uh, I don't know, like four or five towns, maybe, uh-huh. and then so one of the, one good way to measure how many Mormons are around is all the Mormon high school students, mm-hmm. and this is insane. Have to go to seminary class every day that you have school. You have to go to like a Bible study class, basically on top of that, and it's before high school starts. So oh, the wow. seminary class was from six ten in the morning till seven every morning and then you go from like that part was taught in someone's basement and also the big scam in the mormon church is it's all uh there's no like paid employees basically except Uh for like way up top sure like everyone at the local level is just called of god and Uh god wants you so like one of the jobs is seminary teacher so you have to teach a bunch of high schoolers who don't want to be there most of them a, a right. spiritual lesson every morning from like 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. when they're like all half asleep. It's You have to spend a ton of time every night preparing this lesson. And it's just, you know, because God wants you to. Right. It's just, and sorry, that's what you have to do now. It's just, re- and no one for some reason says no to their callings. Uh huh. They get like, I got called into stuff as soon as I turned 12. I got called to like be president of like the 12 and 13 year old boys. Like I was uh-huh. like put in charge of them. And then they told me, uh, it's all, they're very, like, it's very, uh, organizational structure based. So like every group has a president and your first and second counselors, uh-huh. uh, like even the youth ones. So I got called to be the president of the deacons quorum, which is 12 and 13 year olds. And they told me I had to call my first and second counselors. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And they're like, well, just pray and ask God mm-hmm. and God will tell you who to, who it should be. And I was like, all right, well, this is weird. And like, I prayed sure, about right. it. And then like, obviously like no clear voice in my head was just like these two. And then like uh-huh. the next afternoon I was like, uh, I like thought I like, got a sign and it was like weird. Oh, that's convenient. God wanted my two best friends to be my first and second counselors. <laughs> Thanks God. 
Well, you know, he he looks out for everybody. Yeah, every yeah. Now and then. <laughs> Even though they weren't the they weren't the best people for that job, there was probably some other twelve year olds that were more deserving. Right, but, but I, I wasn't friend with them. I gotta imagine there's higher. I gotta imagine there's higher ups that have their. Oh, this guy is probably not the best, but I, I like him, so he he has that job now. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Wow. So okay. So you were in, and and is it called a calling? Because that's some like. To me, that's like some Renaissance fair kind of language. Like someone's like, my calling is blacksmith, so I shall be a blacksmith <laughs> until I finish. Yeah, finish. Well, yeah, it's called your calling. Like people, t- uh, wow. like when you get a phone call from who, I'm trying, because everyone's got a job. And that's part, of the, that's part of how they keep you involved in the church, though, is because you have a job to do. Like sure. you have to, if you're in charge of teaching Sunday school to the eight-year-olds, you're going to come to church every Sunday. Right. Because you have to, otherwise, who's going to teach the eight-year-olds? So it's a way to, like, suck people in and keep them invested. But you would get, so uh, I think it was, like, the ward clerk would call and be like, hey, the bishop wants to meet with you. When can you meet with the bishop? And immediately there's like, ugh, what calling am I have to get? And uh-huh. how bad is it going to be? And it varies. Like, you could get lucky and be put in charge of, like, you know, the 15 and 16 year olds for half an hour and that's not the end of the world. Or you could be put sure. in charge of nursery and have to babysit the three year olds for two hours every Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm sure there's some very noble person that would take it, that upon themselves and, you know. That's the thing. They all have to say, you. everyone says yes. Like, right. well, not everyone, but very it's, rarely do you say no. Right. Yeah. Because I imagine it's like one of those, like, like it's like Pleasantville, like the, the ball doesn't go in and everyone's like, what? Yeah, yeah, they what, don't what, know what, how what to handle doing? it. Yeah, I'm sure if you said no, like there's some bishops who are just not used to being told no. And that was the other thing, like the local leader is called the bishop. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like the priest of a Catholic church, but he's also like just a normal dude who's totally unpaid. And that's like a 40 hour a week job. Right. And he just gets thrown it on top of his other job. And strangely enough, it always seemed to be uh, someone in the ward who was like financially doing very well which mm-hmm. means because you also have to pay in the mormon church it's like a mandatory 10 percent tithing uh-huh. so it's like and they keep it's not like anonymous like in right. like some churches where you just like put it in the plate and it goes along like mm-hmm. you fill out a form with your name on it and, and right. keep your receipts uh, they, they keep for the like end a paper trail yeah yeah and then at the end of the year you have a tithing settlement meeting in december where you go talk to the bishop and he's like looks at your record and is like Oh, you paid uh, five thousand in tithing this year. That's a lot less than you paid last year. What's going on? And they'll start like asking you about it. And there's some people who've been oh like, they asked to see like my like pay stubs to like know that I'm still paying my ten percent tithing. Like Jeez. it's cra- And so it's those. It's the people who've paid the most money over the last like ten years. All of a sudden, like that guy's bishop. He's in charge of everyone. Oh, like, oh that's convenient. Good yeah. for him. Yeah. It, it's everything I hate about the way American society works. On a micro, on a m- yeah. m- micro oh, yeah, but yeah. massive but, but level, but for like also. only three hundred people in Bedford, New Hampshire, <laughs> like right. he's in charge of them because of all this money. Yeah, yeah. it was oh, just uh, so insane. D- and then so did so if you were raised in it, did did you ever hit a moment where you're like, I don't, I don't think this resonates with uh, me. I think like a few different, basically like there's a moment where I was like, well, logically, this all doesn't make sense. Sure, but like there's like. So there's a lot of big picture things that like just didn't compute with my brain. The big one being, and this happened at some point when I was like 14 maybe, whereas the mm-hmm. idea of an omnipotent God doesn't really gel with the idea of free will. Sure. Like the idea of like God knows everything, and it's, I think it's in the Bible, like everything that has been, everything that will be, and everything that is or something like that. Sure. So if he knows everything that will be, he already knows whether or not you're going to be a murderer or a good person like sure it seems like this is kind of an if this is all a test he already knows the score well why Mm -hmm. are we taking this test so that was early on but then there'd be like smaller things like when i was a teenager there was a super awkward moment in one of our sunday school classes we were outside and the guy teaching the lesson was trying to get us to like really like he didn't want to just give us the answer and it was about like type like types of sins like what are like what is a sin and what's not and he's so sure. badly and like everyone you could he, like feel how tense all the teenage it was a teenage boys only class oh yeah and we're all getting like kind of tense because we didn't want to talk about it blah, blah blah and it wasn't even like something like that bad like sexual or anything because wait sure, we covered sure. we'd covered the obvious ones and finally mm-hmm. this kid like real shyly was like uh impure thoughts 
And he was like, exactly. It went on this huge rant about how like thinking something is like the same as doing it. And I was just like, what? We're we're fourteen year old boys. You know how many impure thoughts we have every minute? Like, yeah, we it's can't biologically. Possibly, yeah, we can't programmed. be held responsible for this. And also like think like thinking of something and not doing it is like what separates like good and bad people. Yeah. That's like, what separates sociopaths. Yeah. From yeah. Like you have to, like you, th- you, it enters your mind. You're like, I wouldn't do that. That's like insane. Uh-huh. Like, like, and, but, but no, even thinking about it, I was like, Oh boy, this is trouble. I don't know if I agree with this. <laughs> right. Yeah. I sort of, yeah, I definitely hit a moment, uh, a moment cause I was raised Episcopalian, which uh, like that Robin William, old Robin Williams joke is Catholic light <laughs> is, is how he would describe, describe it. Same religion, half the guilt. Uh, so that's cause perfect. I, yeah. Um, but like Episcopalian was like the, uh, the like more liberal Catholicism. Mm-hmm. It was like, they were cool with women. They were cool with gay people. You know, there were jousting tournaments at my, at my church. Oh, that sounds so much cooler than and, my church. And I would run into, I would run into the, the father. I don't know if he's pre, if priest or whatever at, at the like Chinese takeout mm-hmm. spot. Aren't they, are they ministers? In Episcopalian? Uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I've got a, I got a friend who actually, uh, who works for a, a church in North Carolina who listens to the show pretty regularly. So he could, he's yeah. going to, when he listens department. to this, he's going to, he'll, he'll, <laughs> he'll let me know. But, um, I, I just, I just always remember calling him like, I can't even remember his, his like, fa- if it's like father James or mm. whoever, but, uh, you know, he always seemed nice there. The, the, the thing that, that I think turns off a, a lot of people and then you, everyone go and then there's this huge swath of kind of like, angry, angry, indignant atheism when you're in like your 18s and 20s is that there's no sort of like cool laid back version of religion that (laughs) doesn't, uh, that doesn't appear smarmy. Mm -hmm. Like if you think of like the prototype of the cool Christian youth pastor, who's who's just like trying to explain Jesus via Superman or, or what have you, Uh uh that, that stereotype is like kind of, is, is kind of repellent also, but there's, there's no like, there's no like, Hey, uh, I read the Bible. There's some, some cool stories in there and, uh, and it inspires me. And, uh, yeah, they're not that easy. Yeah. They go deep. But one of the, I listen to a, uh, I'm really into Frisbee golf uh-huh. and one of the podcasts I listen to, uh, is put on by this company and they hired someone to be like, manage their, all their players, their like sponsored players. And mm-hmm. it took me a little while. Like, I was like, what is this guy's just like something? He's just like, he was like, he had too much like bubbliness about him. And I was like, you need sure. to relax a little bit. And then it finally came out how he used to be a youth pastor in Texas. And I was like, ah, oh, okay. Now it all makes sense. Like, uh-huh. yeah, that's like, come on, man. Just yeah. relax. Stop being so positive and happy about everything. Yeah. Not everything is super cool and the best ever. Right. Like, like, relax. He just had, yeah, he had that vibe that, like... Right. Have you guys checked out the new Pillar album? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he also, yeah, he was also a musician and did, yeah, I don't know, he did a lot of, like, but just the, as soon as he said youth pastor, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. That uh-huh. definitely... Ch- I like what you said, that Robin Williams quote, because I say, uh, when I talk about Mormonism on stage, I say it's a lot like Catholic, except we follow the rules. <laughs> which like really separates it in yeah. a big way yeah that was my it was so weird Definitely. the first time i went to a catholic uh, mass when i was 18 mm-hmm. like was just like it was kind of like shocking to hear i was sitting there with my girlfriend who i was having sex with at the time and it was sure. just like uh looking around and i knew like there was a bunch of kids i knew from high school who were there and I knew like what they were into and it was just like wow we're all you're all here being reminded that you're going to help <laughs> Uh-huh. That's a weird. Oh, and you're gonna give them money for that. All right, cool. That's weird. Right. Where at least with the Mormon Church, it's like very much you're either in all the way or you're not. Like there's very they don't leave any room for doubt, and yeah. you're just following the rules, which leads like everyone loves saying how friendly Mormon people are. They're like, oh, I knew some Mormons, mm-hmm. like the nicest people, the nicest people. But that's because they're like the way the church is like packaged. It's basically if you follow all these rules. Mm-hmm. Your life will be blessed and yeah. taken care of. So sure. they like so it's it's like uh, anathem, I guess, to uh, to like 
be depressed and like have problems in your life or be like a, let things bother you and all that sure. because if you're fault like oh are you are you is something wrong with your life well that means you must be sinning somewhere you must be doing something wrong uh-huh. as opposed to just being like oh life's hard <laughs> life is a difficult thing to get through yeah where the Mormon churches is like oh you just follow all these big list of rules and don't drink and don't have uh, don't watch rated R movies and then your uh, life will be great and that's not how it works yeah and like even things like mental health are just such a tricky thing like people uh there are people that have everything going for them on paper you or or they have societal advantages Mm -hmm. but your brain chemistry is just off yeah yeah and it's uh, and you can't exactly throw a pull like if you follow these rules or pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality just yeah then it's fixed because that's just gonna make it worse yeah because then you do all those steps and you're like wait i'm still bummed out like utah i think leads the nation in per capita uh, anti-depression medication. Yeah, I think Utah also leads the uh, number of paid porn subscriptions in the oh, United yeah. States because, again, they follow the rules. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you got to pay for it. Don't steal it. That'd yeah. Be, oh, yeah. For, I remember at one point uh, I stumbled on some like w- porn my little brother had downloaded on a computer when I still lived uh-huh. at home back when I was like 19 or so. And it was like, uh, it was like, cartoony like world of warcraft type character and like sure. and in my brain i was just like oh you're like there it like the church is putting you down this weird path because you think if you watch regular porn it's like this terrible sin but so like i'm sure. gonna watch i'm gonna look at these cartoon drawings of elves or something and that's not as bad like mm-hmm. i'm sure that is how his mind was working and it was yeah. like oh yeah, no that's gonna be way worse for you <laughs> in the long run yeah yeah no repression you can you can try repressing all you want but it it, it it ekes out some of the the not to not to get too crass but some of the freakiest things that i've i've done uh sexually have been with like conservative catholic republican oh women. yeah 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 no i agree yeah that that is very like my, my it's so repressed in the mormon church my i got like like straight out of like an after school special like talk for my mom like hey uh-huh. can we like she came up and was like hey can we go for a walk and i was just like what we've never gone on a walk ever in my life what sure. is this about and as soon as like we started going on a walk it's because she found like one picture of a naked woman I'd printed off of the computer, like off uh-huh. of the internet, not even like hardcore or anything, just like right. a topless woman. Sure. And was so concerned about the path this was going to lead me on and mm-hmm. where I was going to go that we had to have this like serious intervention. And I was just like, oh, okay, all right. Yeah, mom, right. Yeah, no, not, this, you're not stopping me. Uh-huh. And then, so did you have a moment when you were like, when you just renounce renounced everything or were no it was like a slow like a, it, i almost got real sucked in because i actually went part of the uh the, their scheme i guess is the missionaries you know the mormon missionaries with yep. the name tags mm-hmm. so those that is a two-year commitment if you're a guy i don't know if they change these uh 18 months if you're a woman mm-hmm. um and it's where you get the church assigns you an area somewhere and then they train you and send you out to this area where you like do all this church ba- it used to be knocking on a lot of doors but sure. they but they're also a very uh statistically driven they keep mm-hmm. very good records of members and who's like inactive and active and they keep sure. they keep track of everyone so they changed it when my little brother was more involved he he got sent to the philippines for his mission oh. to being more uh, instead of like knocking on random doors it was more tracking down inactive members in your area and like uh-huh. finding them and trying to like bring them back to church they tried when i was in college i think my mom or someone from the church found like somehow they got my address of my college house and like knocked on our, my door one day when i was uh-huh. like smoking weed with my roommates and i just uh, we looked yeah, out yeah. the window and i was like oh my god it's the missionaries and i just opened the door with a joint in my hand and was like, and they were quickly like, all right, yep, yeah, see you later. We don't, we're not going to talk to you. Uh-huh. I was like, yeah, I don't know how. Like, and they do that where uh, my sister, I've been hit up, like they've gotten my phone number before or something. And I'll get like or emails like asking for, or no, my sister's gotten stuff asking for my information because they know I haven't officially been. All right, well, I got to backtrack because I so didn't get kicked out. They're calling your they're calling your sister trying to get in touch with yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, trying to get like my info. That's like and, a debt collector. Yeah, and yeah, exa- oh no, okay. yeah, they're very persuasive cuz well, like I said, they're stat driven, so they realized they did the numbers probably and they were like wait we're wasting it takes this many hours of missionary work to like get one new convert. 
uh-huh. knocking on doors, or it takes this many fewer hours to get an inactive member back in church and back sure. to paying us money. And th- they, and it's so weird how people in the church think all these decisions come from God, because a big part of the Mormon church is they have a modern day prophet, the guy in Salt Lake City who's at the head of the church. They think gets direct revelation from God. Right. And so when he announces a change in the church, it's God saying that, like when the church used to be racist up until 1978. And then mm-hmm. they were like... Yeah, I saw Book of Mormon. 1978, yeah. God changed his mind yeah. about yes. black people. Well, they... He, he... Yeah, so it's a whole thing like God changed his mind. And they don't apologize either. That's what's crazy is they've never apologized uh-huh. because apologizing for something like that would be admitting God made a mistake. Right, God so is infallible. There was, yeah, there was a few years ago where there's like an, there's an Onion type uh, website for Mormon News called like mormonnewsroom.com. And that website published a fake article saying the church had apologized for like its hundred years of racism, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and it got picked up by a few like main, more mainstream media things. And like they sure. reached out to the church, uh-huh. like, hey, can we get further comment on this? And the church was like, oh, no, we're not apologizing. They had to like reiterate that we're not apologizing <laughs> for not letting black people have the priesthood for 130 years or whatever oh it was. God. Yeah, it was so perfect. Oh, it, was, wow. it was great for them to be put on the spot like that. Right. And so you were saying you got kicked out. Oh, so well, tell, yeah, tell me of. about, let's kind of trace this because I feel like this yeah. is how you become a comedian eventually. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the the more missionary thing is, re- especially when you're a uh, young man, they like really push. You go on a mission your whole like uh, teenage life, like staying like worthy to, is. It, you want to stay worthy so you can go on a mission. It's like an honor thing. Re- uh, return with honor is what it's called. You go serve your mission and come home. And is there a, an idea that if you do a really good job, you'll get a good location? No, I think that's that's part one of the things that sucked when I got my mission calling uh, was location because I had there were th- three other uh, guys my year who were all going on their mission at the same time, and one so you fill out your forms and you can decide whether you like it's you say whether you're okay with going out of the country. Doesn't uh-huh. mean you're necessarily going to get sent out of the country, but you just have to say whether or not you're okay with it. And if right. you're not, they'll just send you somewhere in the U.S. So I like said I'm okay without a country because even though I wasn't, did not give a shit about the church at that point. I was like, yeah, at least I could learn a foreign language. That'd be cool. Like my dad, totally. went, my dad served his mission in Japan and yeah, still yeah. is fluent in Japanese and like goes there for work specifically it's good skill because to have. yeah because he can speak Japanese. Uh-huh. Uh, so my three friends who all got their call their mission calls before me, one went to. Peru, mm-hmm. one went to Rome, and one went uh-huh. to London, and I get mine, and it's Wyoming. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, it's That's... Denver. It was Denver North, is what the mission's called, but it's like, it Denver is in the northeast corner of Colorado, so it's like the northern half of Denver, and then all the way into like Cheyenne, Wyoming, and like right. beyond. And it's exactly. a bicycle. It's like mission. if they called Alabama East Florida. Yeah, 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 exactly. I was like, oh, all right. I, you, they, or West Florida. They show, yeah, West Florida. They show you the map, <laughs> and it was like a little pit piece of Denver, and then all of Wyoming. And then the other thing with this is if you get sent to the Midwest, one of the things I was not looking forward to is you get fat. Like we, I saw yeah, yeah. a missionary come back because it's part of the uh, – like members duty to feed missionaries. So mm-hmm. like the calendar goes around every Sunday and you sign up for like to have the missionaries over for dinner. But in the Midwest where there are a lot of members, you can end up eating like two or three dinners a night and it's all steak and potatoes because uh-huh. you're in like Colorado and Wyoming. So yep. like we had one uh, family friend who was older than me and got, he got sent to Utah, I think, which is just what a terrible place to serve your Mormon mission. Sure. Uh, and he came back probably like seventy pounds heavier. And oh like he got God. off the he got off the plane. I was like, holy cow! But it was weird because you can get sent. Like my little brother got sent to the Philippines and lost a ton of weight. Oh yeah, because he was getting served like blood soup and stuff, and he was like, no, no, thank you. Right. And also got <laughs> and also got dengue fever while he was there. Oh no, and has like permanent kidney issues now. Uh, oh. Which oh. My, I, I got some dirty looks from my mom when that came out over Christmas. That he has like kidney problems from, from dengue, and I was like, uh-huh. "That's so weird. God would uh, choose that for him. What a weird <laughs> thing!" Like Ian was serving his mission in the Philippines, and God was like, "Yeah, oh, you get dengue fever." So I, so yeah, so I went through like all like senior year of high school. I didn't even apply for colleges because I was going on my mission. Uh-huh. Um, and then I got a girlfriend at the end of senior year who wasn't Mormon, uh-huh. and like 
quickly do started doing all the sinful things with her because I was 18. Totally. And, and that's a normal reaction to have. Yeah. And definitely. so, but I still like proceeded to like continue with the whole mission. Like you'd go through a bunch of interviews and stuff like that with right. local leadership. And they always ask you like, are you, it's called the law of chastity in the Mormon church. Uh-huh. They have like the law of chastity and the word of wisdom are the two big ones. The word of wisdom is like no coffee, no alcohol, no cigarettes. Sure. And the law of chastity is obviously the no, like even like petting, they would probably be like, that's what mm-hmm. are you, what, that's a sin. Um, so I just lied in all my interviews. I was uh-huh. like, oh, yeah, 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 I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Because I, I also knew the other guys my age were lying and going through. One of them was like the local, not even like the local like town leader, but like the New Hampshire. Uh-huh. Like his dad was basically in charge of like all of Southern New Hampshire's churches. Yeah. Also still not paid. Uh, uh-huh. And I knew he was like fooling around with his girlfriend and he like just left on his mission, didn't repent for anything. So I was like, all right, let's just keep, I'll keep lying too. And right. so the hypocrisy is getting set up in your mind early. Oh yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Where and that is just like the whole confession process, which I didn't really learn. I'll get into that. Cause I learned how messed up the confession process is once I got in trouble. Uh-huh. So, uh, I was having sex with my girlfriend, went to leave on my mission anyways. And there was another, uh, a really close friend of mine who lived, he used to, he grew up with me, but lived in another church. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was going through a repentance process for having sex with his girlfriend. He wasn't going on his mission. That was never, he was like joining the Marines or something. Uh, right. And the repentance process was just like driving him nuts. Like you have to like do all, like you have to meet with the bishop like every week and do Bible study. And he gives you like homework, I think. It's just right. ridiculous. And he, in frustration, I think like said, mentioned, he was like, this is ridiculous that I'm like going through all this when I have a friend who just left on his mission who was having sex with his girlfriend. And it's a very small community, so they were just like, hmm, who is he talking about? And it was like He's quickly, talking about like, Brad. Oh, yeah. He's <laughs> talk- and also my farewell Sunday is like a big moment in the church. Like I, I spoke and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and my girlfriend at the time showed up Mm-hmm. looking way too sexy for Mormon <laughs> church. Like she, she was very, very, like, she still is very attractive, but she was like in the skinny little dress showing a little cleavage. And sure. I was like, she walked in, I was like, oh, uh, and so I'm sure every adult leader I dealt with looked at that and also knew me my whole life and knew how impulsive and lack of control I had in sure. general. So they're like, there's no way something's not happened. Like, yeah, like, come on. So I left for my mission. Uh, and they first send you to the missionary training center in salt lake city utah uh-huh. which is ba- like it's like a prison like you show up and they've got walls surrounding it oh uh my God. yeah it's like this compound you're not allowed to leave and just immediately i was just like this is the most boring thing in the world and they just like start teaching you like high pressure sales tactics on right. how to like get people in and like you get them on this commitment cycle and like blah 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 blah, blah. and i was like i don't want to participate in any of this and it was like uh, the other dudes in my group were just the most nerdy Mormony people. We uh-huh. like during our rec time one day we went to play basketball, and I was the best guy in our group at basketball, which is I am terrible. I am so unathletic, and I was like, right. "Wow, this is bad, guys. You are a sorry group of people." Uh, so I was there a week before I got. We were like in class, and all of a sudden, like the buzzer like went off to like call me to the office, basically, like you're in high school. Yep. Like, oh, can you send? They're, we're all called Elder. Keep saying Elder Hagen uh, has a phone call, blah, blah, blah. Uh-huh. And I was worried that was going to be my, about my aunt who had cancer at the time. I was like, oh, no, something happened to Aunt Joan. Right, right. And I, I go and answer the phone, and it's my local... I don't know if it was my bishop or the stake president, the guy who's like in charge of the local church or the Southern New Hampshire, one of those two. And they start everything with a prayer. So he starts, he's like, all right, we're going to start with the prayer, sure. And he, in his prayer, he asks God to help me be honest in my answers to him. And as soon as he said that, like my, I, my eyes like got wide on the other end of the phone. I was like, oh, <laughs> crap. They all know what's going on. And immediately he asked, like, for, he just launches right into the sex stuff. And I mean, it was like, yeah, and like started confessing and like started crying. It was this big emotional mess. Blah, blah, blah. And he was like, all right, we're going to uh, have you, you're going to have to talk to the bishop of that's in charge of the training center and mm-hmm. like confess to him to make it, you know, official. And I was like, all right, fine, I'll do that. And so that's when it got, like, real weird because, so I had to confess to the local, this bishop, who I'd never met before in my life. Right. And I go into his office. It's not like the Catholic Church where it's, like, anonymous. Mm -hmm. You have to go into the office of this 
uh, older man who you don't know yeah, and this tell him stranger. intimate details yeah. of your sex life. Yeah, and he the first thing he does is pull out a form and starts filling out this form with like all my information on it, time, uh-huh. date, all that stuff, like like a like it's a police interrogation and with a big list of so we can write down all the sins I say. And Jesus. so he starts asking, and I was like, I had sex, blah, blah, blah. And he asks, I remember he asked about digital penetration, which took me a minute to be like, what do you mean? And I was like, oh, did I finger hurt? Yeah, duh. We had sex. <laughs> like, like, do you right. think we just skipped yeah. all those steps? Like, what, what do you think 18-year-olds are doing? Right. We had a lot of free time together. <laughs> and then he asked, he asked me how many times we had had sex. And I started in my mind uh, tabulating the condom boxes I had bought. Because it's a dozen each, and I was like, yeah, we'd only yeah. been having sex for like m- maybe a year before I left, maybe less than that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right, well, five, that's five, I bought five boxes, that's 60 times. She also didn't, she lived in uh, Manhattan, I lived in New Hampshire. Uh, look at me, trying to like, <laughs> trying to justify my low sex count when I was 18. Right, uh, right, right. And and it was more, I didn't lose my virginity until I was 20, so go oh, you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Uh, Continue. It's that Episcopalianness. Uh, <laughs> no, it's 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 me being uh, an only child who doesn't know how to talk to humans. <laughs> oh yeah, that'll do it too. That makes it more difficult. Um, yeah. So I, I did the math in my head, and then like looked at this guy, and I knew I was like, I cannot say sixty. If I say sixty, this is going to be a disaster. So I just said five. Right. Instead, I did total number of boxes. Uh-huh. I was like uh, five times, and he just went. <sighs> That's a lot. And I was like, oh, man. Right. So if, I'm if, glad I didn't give the real number. You would have just burst into flames. <laughs> like, you would not have known 60. You would have just ran out of here. So you guys would have ran me out with pitchforks if I said 60. Right. He would have just spontaneously just gone right up in flames. Yeah. Yeah. Like, or just pulled, a can, of, pulled yeah. a can of gas out and just doused <laughs> yeah, himself. Like five. It was so funny that he thought five was like this terrifying amount. And so he, ba- he said after that, he was like, you're proud. Yeah. You're not going to be able to stay on your mission. With that, uh-huh. and I was and in my mind, I was just like, "Yes, thank God, I'm getting out of here." And the next day, I was like, "They like booked me a flight and shipped me back home." I like took an early bus. It was so funny because I got put on like the like 5 a.m. bus that goes to the airport uh-huh. with all the missionaries who were leaving the MTC to go on their missions to like fly out to like their assigned sure. territories. And then I'm on the back of the bus, just like I'm going home. Right, <laughs> I'm the yeah. bad one, and on, I'm I'm like at my connection. At the airport, I ran into a missionary who was going to my sister. My sister was on a mission in Chicago at the time. Sure. And he was going to her mission. He had been sent home for because he got like hit by a car on his bike uh-huh. and got sent home for like medical reasons and then went back out once he was healed. Damn. Which, yeah, I know. That's how good, how good they are at controlling. And also, here's the crazy part. You pay for this. Right. This is not funded by the church. You have to – You it costs like – at the time, ten thousand dollars. Jesus, uh, to do this, and it's like monthly. You like they break down into monthly payments. And it used to be in the seventies when my dad went. It was based entirely. It wasn't just like a flat thing. It was based on where you went. So if you got sent to a place that was more expensive to live, like if you got sent to Tokyo for your mission, right. it would cost you a ton of money. Or but you could get sent to like uh, the Philippines, and you'd be like, oh, it costs you like six hundred dollars a year. To do it. Yeah. And so it was like totally. So they they made it universal the price, and then like the church pays for your like housing and stuff like that mm-hmm. to like even things out. But yeah, so I ran into a guy who was returning to the mission where my sister was and knew my sister, and mm-hmm. he was like, "Oh, so where are you headed?" And I was like, uh, "Home." I got kicked off, and he was just like, "Oh, like so like like people I told." were more emotionally drained than I was. Right. When I was like, I'm just yeah, I'm going home. And like, and then so how did and how did you feel going home? Did you feel relieved? Did I you felt feel like you had so dodged a bullet? Relieved. Oh. Did you have that, did you have like a moment of well, now I get to do what I really want to do or did you not know what that was? Uh I didn't really know what it was, but I like mostly saw it as an out. I was like, I uh-huh. think I'm like this can finally get me out of here. So I don't have to like do and like I don't have to go to church, I don't have to do any of that stuff. And how and, old were you? I was 19. 19. Was I? Yeah, I hadn't been 20 yet. Yeah, because I turned 20 the following December. Sure. And had, uh, that's when I had like heart surgery. I also found out later that I like needed heart surgery and stuff like that. So it was like, good thing I wasn't on my mission. This could have been bad. Right. What'd you need heart surgery for? I had a leaky aortic valve oh, that man. I was just born with and no one ever noticed. I got in a car accident, uh, fell asleep driving and drove my Comanche pick, my 
beloved Comanche pickup truck into a tree. Oh, no. And then they brought me to the ER just as like a precaution because I didn't have my seatbelt mm-hmm. on and just bounced. It was crazy. Like, I was out cold. I woke up yeah. after I hit the tree. I bounced around in there. I'd like broken off the turn signal lever. Uh-huh. I'd uh, broken off like the shifter, like just for my body bouncing around. So they brought me to the ER just as a precaution. And I thought I was going to be like in and out. I texted some friends because I was supposed to. I was like going to a poker game. I was like, yeah, I'll be there in a few hours. Wait, like no worries. And they saw like just looking at my EKG, they were like, uh-huh. something's wrong, like with your heart. And the next morning, so I had to stay overnight. The next morning, they did like a, a sonogram, ultrasound type thing, looking right. at it. And then the cardiologist came in and he was like, oh yeah, you need a new aortic valve. I had surgery like three weeks later. Oh my god, yeah, it was gnarly. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I get. Oops, sorry about that. Oh, it's okay. I, get, I get kicked off. Well, I get sent home for my mission. Uh-huh. And uh, they told the bishop told my parents they gave they they he said to her or said to my mom like hey Brad's gonna need your support now he's when he gets off that plane he's gonna be a wet noodle he's gonna be like crying and very upset mm-hmm. and I think I think this, my mom told me this in like anger because I got off the plane and was just like beaming like, right, I was right. so happy to be back home and not have to go to Wyoming that my mom and my mom was just like angry that I was sure. not like soul crushed by this and it was so weird because in my whole like in I grew up in the same church my whole life yeah yeah in that whole time, one person had been sent home early from his mission, and but he'd been gone like twenty months, so it was like real close. So right. like it was like, wait, is he home early or not? I actually had my Sunday school teacher at that time like pulled me out to like ask. Uh-huh. He was like, wait, is Brett home early? What's going on? I was like, I think so. I don't know. I think he got in trouble for like fooling around with a girl on his mission uh, and got sent home. I, see. I, see. I was gone a week. I missed one Sunday. <laughs> came and then was back and i was at the church for like the tuesday night youth group type stuff Uh Uh, and this little boy one of my good friends little brothers mitchell like was running down the hallway and like stopped dead in his tracks he's probably like six years old which is great because kids are so honest yeah and he was just like didn't you just leave for your mission what are you doing here and his mom heard him and like like ran down the hallway and just like shoot him away it was like get it nope right don't talk to him don't talk to him don't talk to our fallen elder yeah yeah exactly and i just want to be like i was having sex (laughs) it was great yeah what it was totally (laughs) worth it so then so i went home and that and the my whole confessional process wasn't over i had to go to because my sins were so grievous i had to go to what's called the high council Uh uh-huh which is like this is where it gets like sco- like spooky like weird secret society type stuff. So I had to go uh-huh. to instead of just where before I confessed in front of the bishop one on one. This was a room at a different church at like the local headquarters church, right. and it was I like sat at the end of this conference table. That there's had like a panel of people. Twelve, yeah, it was twelve old white dudes uh, around this table, and then me, and then and them oh, like asking no. me all these questions about. Digital what I did, yeah, and like if I had one of the things that I knew, I I was pretty sure they're going to ask. But also, there's one of the things along the way that I was like, "This is stupid." Was the garments? Have you heard about Mormon garments? Yeah, the special underwear. Mm-hmm. So you get those when you go through the temple and get your endowments, which is what I had to do before I could go on my mission. So I went through yeah. the temple like a month before my mission and got the stupid underwear that mm-hmm. is that has like some symbols sewn into it. Sure, but mostly it's made to just like be modest like the wind like the male version is basically like long briefs that go down to like above your knee and then mm-hmm. like a white t-shirt yeah, yeah but the women get like the ugliest like leotard onesie thing like it's yeah. so hard to find someone attractive in that basically right, right. like they're just hideous but so i went through the temple and once you get your garments you're supposed to wear them all the time right and that weekend i was going to visit my girlfriend in new york and I was just like, and it, I was a little torn. I was like, am I going to wear these? I was like, I don't know if I want to wear these because she's going to see and be like, what is this crap? And also, I know I'm going to have sex. So I feel like it's worse if I wear my garments and right. then have sex. And that actually came up at the high camp. Like one of the old men asked me about like, were you wearing your garments before? And I was like, no. And I think that was like actually worse because I wasn't wearing, that's an extra sin not wearing right. my garments. Uh-huh. And also in their minds, they were probably like, oh, you had your garments on, you wouldn't have had sex. Like, no, it doesn't keep your boners away. It's, right. not, they're not, it's not magical, no matter yeah. how much they want to make it magical. So I went through that uh, whole, got like, it was very short, but just like terrifying. And also like, 
I can't imagine if you're a woman who has to go through like this process and you're just oh my god, it's got to be even of more, men. yeah, got to be even more and uncomfortable, about, even more shame, yeah. like just projecting even more shame on you. Because I mean, I feel like women's sexuality gets kind of like uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's viewed as inherently shameful in most yeah, religions. Yeah, yeah, it's bad. Yeah, but if five times for, for you is too much, then <laughs> oh yeah, Who it's got to be even worse if you are a woman yeah. in that situation. <laughs> I was I was in Dubai. Uh, like a month and a half ago, two months ago, maybe. And uh, one of the funniest things I saw or experienced when I was there was I was uh, watching Grease on TV, like super uh-huh. hungover one morning mm-hmm. in the hotel because they only have like two channels that are English and they're movie channels. Right, right. And I didn't really notice how much censorship was happening up until I saw Grease and they uh-huh. like, started cutting out all the sex stuff. And I also yeah, yeah. didn't realize because I didn't watch Grease since I was like 12. How uh-huh. much sex is in Greece? Like it's that's what it's all about. Yeah, it's just all about sex. Yeah, Grease Lightning. Like that was a High School Musical from where I was from. That's like yeah. like, <laughs> like high schoolers used to sing that song. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Like and, do that, and that was one of the and that was like the uh, the Grease Lightning song was when I realized like man like it's their their uh, opinions on sex are really hurting their censorship because they blocked out they cut out the line about tits uh-huh. uh but then left in they cut that line out but then left in the next line which was like the wheels will s- scream the chicks will cream or something mm-hmm. they left in the chicks will cream part because you know the sensor was just like yeah yeah chicks will cream eh, no that can't that, women can't have orgasms so that can't <laughs> be what that's about like no reason to cut that out of there sure like, and they left in there's a line when uh rizzo like is at the sleepover uh-huh and sings the song, like, Look at Me, I'm Sandra D. They cut out, like, most of that because it's basically, like, a, like, modesty shaming song. Sure. But then leave in. Right afterwards, she jumps out of the window and jumps in the car with Kanicki. They pull out of the driveway, stop, and she turns to her, his two friends in the back seat and just goes, what is this, a gangbang? Hit the street. And, like, kicks him <laughs> out of the car. And that was left in there. Right. And I was like, man, they are really, they really don't understand the finer points of, right. of, of uh, sexual slang. And I had a weird hearing that. It like brought back a crazy memory of being in like sixth grade, I think. Uh huh. And two kids like, uh, like we're like kind of we're just joking around in the classroom and like one yeah. kid punched me and then another kid punched me on the other side and I said what is this a gangbang <laughs> and my teacher was like <gasps> Brad out in the hallway and like dragged me out and was like do you know what that word? and I could tell instantly I was like I don't know what this word means obviously uh-huh. it means way worse than I think yeah, it yeah, does yeah. because you are freaking out right now Mr. Cook you are nervous <laughs> and I was just like no and he was like <sighs> all right back in class and i was just like oh boy i dodged one there all right i'm glad i'm ignorant of, yeah, yeah ex- <laughs> you know, exactly can you imagine if a sixth grader was like oh yeah i know what a gangbang is right sure <laughs> my my next question would be how <laughs> yeah yeah from greece that's the other thing like we my mom was freaking out over me printing out like a nudie photo from the internet when i was like 15 uh-huh. but then was letting us watch greece when i was like nine. Oh, dude my i wasn't allowed to watch the simpsons but I was allowed to watch Ren and Stimpy. And I think that see, <laughs> that's how I learned what avant-garde surrealism was and like yeah, all yeah. the all the gross close-ups. Oh, they were so gross. Yeah. Okay, so so you you go you go you go uh before the the board of oh, Mormonism yeah, the, the and, high council. And, and you tell them all your dirty secrets. At, at what point are they are you are you done? Like how much more of this so, do you go through before you you pack up your yeah, box? Yeah, I basically like checked out at, right after that. I was hoping to be excommunicated. Uh huh. Because you get excommunicated and you're just done and you don't have to worry about it. But right. instead, they put me on probation, which is like you can work your way back from. And I think I went to one more meeting with my local bishop to uh-huh. like talk about, and then I just like stopped showing up. Right. And, like everything. My parents still tried to get me to go to church for a little while, but then my dad won a. So like it was soon I was still a pretty good Mormon other than the sex thing. Like I didn't drink or do any drugs right. or any of that. And but after I got kicked off my mission, I had some friends who were just like, Look, Brad, you're going hard now. Like, let's 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 go crazy. Yeah. And so I like started smoking weed and stuff like that. And it was a few months after I'd been kicked out. My parents would try they'd at least come down and invite me to church like on Sundays. Mm-hmm. And I got home like super high one Saturday. And this is when I first started smoking weed, so like you get super high yeah, every yeah. time. And my dad came down to like wake me up to like invite me to church and noticed uh, uh, 
a empty bowl that I'd eaten like three pieces of cheesecake out of and like a bunch uh-huh. of chips and salsa that I had crushed. Like, noticed <laughs> like just like a smorgasbord of munchies in front of me and just went, have a good Sunday. And just left. He didn't even try to invite me. I was like, all right, good. You figured it out. We're on the same page. <laughs> yeah, that's that's mo- that's my kind of, of party is just a bunch of chips and, oh, and, and yeah, slices was, of cheesecake. And this is the thing with my dad too is it's, I don't know where, because my mom is definitely in it all the way at this point yeah. i wouldn't even i wouldn't even want my mom to leave the church because she would just have no right community like, at all community like she or, would have no well, one well that it does function as a positive thing in in people's lives that's that's the point i hit like i because i used to be once once i learned learned the the word atheist and that it was a possibility not to believe in god <laughs> i definitely went through that period where i was just kind of because you know there's the kind of like shitty like the kind of shitty like douchebag atheists oh, yeah, that the are aggressive ones like, yeah, yeah. yeah so i definitely kind of went through through that kind of time in my mm-hmm. life and then i eventually realized you know um oh who who's uh who's inviting me over for thanksgiving when i'm home from college oh it's the the nice catholic woman with the ronald reagan calendar in, <laughs> in her in her yeah. in her kitchen Oh, who's the guy that lent me a hundred bucks when I couldn't make rent when my first couple of years in New York? Oh, it's my friend at, who I work at Starbucks with, who's a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, he actually did that. Yeah, that's awesome. He he doesn't know me from Adam other than we worked at Starbucks together mm-hmm. for less than a, less than a year, but I was in a really bad spot, and then I paid him back. So, um, but yeah, just kind of learning, you know, kind yeah, of yeah. stuff like that, and then you know, being able to call myself on my own hypocritical bullshit really fueled my growth personally, Mm -hmm. I think. So I'm, I'm at a point now where, uh, you know, the my friend, my people in my life who are, are religious, uh, you know, we, we talk, we talk about it. Neither of us is trying to convince the Mm -hmm. other person of anything, but the, if someone wants to like, start quoting start quoting uh the bible when they're trying to make laws about pe- people's <laughs> people's rights i yeah. i will go i will yeah. i i do want to get in someone's some face. things about slavery i want to get yeah. in someone's face and go okay your god doesn't exist yeah my friend my friend's god he he ex- he probably exists and he exists to him your god definitely does not <laughs> if he's saying that kind of making you say that kind of hateful yeah shit. yeah oh the more it's i try i definitely deal with that like not in like general religious terms, but specifically with Mormon people sometimes uh-huh. because the, like the church itself has like some real like his, historical issues mm-hmm. from like back in the day that the church, like when you're growing up in it, they basically like just never talk about, even though it's there. Like you yeah. can find it on like the official like LDS website and all that stuff and like look into it, but they just like never bring it up. So it's one of those things mm-hmm. when you're talking to like some, they call them TBMs, true believing Mormons. Yeah. Uh, when you're dealing with some of those people where you like, I have a brother-in-law who my sister has left the church and he is like third generation, maybe Mormon, which is, it's a, not a very old religion. So third yeah. generation is a lot. And he's to the point where my sister has like they've there's a lot of documents online. Like there's a big one called the CES letter, mm-hmm. which was this guy put out probably like eight or nine years ago, who was in there's a CES is church educational system because one of the right. ways they keep you involved as a single adult is they have you go to these church education classes on like Thursday night uh-huh. uh, to continue your learning. And he would go to these classes and had some questions about like the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith and the history and would ask and the te- would kind of make the teacher uncomfortable and be like, oh, we'll talk to the bishop about it. And then he would be kind of uh, uncomfortable. It's kind of like, uh, have you yeah. seen A Simple Man? Uh, the yeah. Cohen brother where he, yeah, gets, yeah. he gets put pushed up to the higher rabbis and then the last guy like has nothing that like just says some r- random and he's like, what? Uh, <laughs> right, right, yeah. So this guy just kept getting pushed further and further up and basically being told the same thing, which is just... Uh, pray and fast about it and like god will answer your questions and he was like no i want you to answer my questions because this is about the church and this is important so he wrote this big not even that long it's probably like 20 pages like a pdf that he put online saying like here are my questions i don't know why i'm not getting answers but this is really annoying and some of them are like real and it's funny because he went into like the real nitty-gritty of truth in the in the church where i i left just basically because i was like 
you guys all seem kind of crazy. Uh, the whole like logic, there's some logical flaws in here where yeah. he was like, like one of the things he wrote about, which was brilliant in the book of Mormon, which is for, uh, for people who don't know, the book of Mormon is like in a, uh, a supplement to the Bible. And it's basically right. the story of these people who, these civilizations in the Americas who yeah. existed for these thousands of years. And then Jesus after he died, was crucified and resurrected in the Middle East, uh, came and visited the Americas too. Like just, you mm-hmm. know, like teleported basically. Right. And then like converted a bunch of them, like converted some of them, but then some of them were anti and then a bunch of wars and all this stuff. Right. And so this guy in his CES letter questions, and so the, and the whole Book of Mormon is translated by Joseph Smith who dug it out of the ground in upstate yep, New York. Yep. Uh, and he had some questions about like, hey, why are these maps that are drawn in here uh, identical to the maps where Joseph Smith lived? Like stuff like that. Like this is jo- the county where Joseph Smith lived and here's the map that's supposed to be like somewhere in Central America. They're identical. Or right. why are there horses in the Book of Mormon when there were no horses in the Americas at right. that time? Just real simple things. And the church would have to, like they, their answer to the horses question was tapers. Which, ah, you, yeah, like tapers. those giant anteater right. type things, which have never been domesticated for any yeah. use. And they're like, oh, no, they were riding tapers into battle. And you're just, ugh, that's, you're stretching that's it there. A, that, that would be a really quick war because I would just start laughing at anybody yeah, who's riding like, up on a, a taper. taper. Like, what? Yeah. And also there's no uh, DNA evidence. Part of the church's belief is also... Like these tribes in the Americas were is, is, uh, Israelites initially, uh-huh. and they took these weird peapod boats across the Atlantic mm-hmm. and made it to South America. And there's no DNA evidence of Israeli blood in sure. in, in the Americas, and also these giant civilizations where and that had massive battles. There's no evidence of those either archaeologically, mm-hmm. and there were there were church. I guess not paid. I mean, kind of, because they worked for BYU, which is the big Mormon school, Mm -hmm. uh, archaeologists in like the 70s and 80s who were looking forever to try to like dig up the stuff Uh to be like, eh, but we found where the Nephites had their massive battle and said like one of them at the end of his career was basically like, oh yeah, I don't know if I believe in this anymore. I couldn't, I looked forever and couldn't find squat. Right. (laughs) Like this is looking bad. Yeah. It's like that guy who predicted the rapture was going to happen. So he showed up to Times Square and then Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't happen. Then he just, he was like, I did. Yeah, he's like I did. I forgot to carry. I forgot to carry the one. Yeah. it's actually in a couple years. Yeah, yeah just yeah. got back on the ferry to Staten Island. <laughs> so, how do you go from being a fallen Mormon to New York City and and stand up comedy? Uh well, I uh, part part of being one of six kids mm-hmm. was like that's how I got my attention was from being the funny kid. Yeah, like, I was always the wise ass. I got mm-hmm. called the wise ass all the time. Uh, and so I lived in New Hampshire. And was like putzing around going to school. I worked at a poker room back then. Like a a quasi, I think it was basically legal. This is after you're kicked off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After I, because I, yeah, because that heart thing came up. Uh uh, And I realized I needed heart surgery. And to get back on my parents' insurance, I had to become a full-time student. So I just like ran to the technical school Uh and just signed up for a full load. It was so funny. I showed up. Uh, to, I was like, I want to register for classes. And she was like, all right, well, uh, you're going to have to take a placement test to like find out where what classes you can go into. Or if you took the SATs, we can, if you're, what your score is, we can go off of that. And I had taken SATs. And I was like, yeah, I got a 1100. And she was like, looked at me like, what are you doing here? Right. <laughs> she was like, oh, okay, yeah, take whatever class you want. You're fine. <laughs> uh, so I just signed up for a full load of classes just to get insured. And while there, I met a friend from high school who worked at a poker room, Uh and he just gave me a job. And one of the nights we worked was in this terrible, seedy motel in Manchester, New Hampshire, called the Queen City Inn. Yeah. That was just so gross. It was the first crack pipe I ever saw. It was like (laughs) in the hallway of this place, just like on the floor. Uh, a lot of prostitutes, just grimy as hell. Uh-huh. And they also were randomly running a comedy, stand-up comedy contest that was run by a woman called Madam Ha Ha, uh-huh. which is just so perfect. Like, yeah, like someone who's who's running the type of person who would run a comedy contest to like make fifty bucks in right. Southern New Hampshire. I know I don't know anything else about her, but I know exactly yeah. what she's yeah, like. Yeah, exactly, Madam Ha Ha. So I 
signed up for that contest just because I, I was like, I want to try stand-up comedy. Yeah. And then there were so few people signed up, I automatically made it to the second round because <laughs> like I did my I did my like Tuesday show or Friday showcase or whatever it was, uh-huh. and did I was so nervous and did so bad. Like in the middle of my set, I just blatantly ripped off an Adam Sandler joke. I uh-huh. seen cause the part of the reason I loved stand-up was uh, I had a random DVD set of 80 stand-up comedy where someone basically went hmm. to like the clubs from the 80s and found their old VHS tapes yeah and just bought them all and just threw them on a DVD so it was like this craziest so this is like bootleg evening at the improv yeah 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 like there was some I think comic trip live was on there I think that was around back then uh, I think Caroline's had a show also during that and, time like Kathleen Madigan did it when she was really young oh really well yeah, yeah. this wasn't like t- I don't think these were like produced for TV these were like the club's VHS right. camera. This like is what recorded. they this is what they charge like the you yeah, know, you, the new talent night yeah, you fifteen want, bucks. Yeah, you for. want a copy of yeah. yeah. And but it was wow. full of it had Chris Rock, Ray Romano, Richard Belzer, uh, uh, Richard Lewis. It wow. had everyone who be like it was basically anyone who became famous. They're like, all right, sweet, we can dig up their old comedy. And they had one that was Adam Sandler. Yeah, and yeah. He had some great jokes on there, and one of them was. Uh, uh, I was, he was like, I was, so I was hanging out with my friends, uh, we were out of the bar and I saw this beautiful woman and I really wanted to talk to her, but I was nervous. And my friend said like, Hey, what's, what's the worst that could happen if you like ask her out, what's she going to say no? And I finally got up the courage and I went over and started talking to her and she said, get away from me, you loser. And I was like, ah, <laughs> kind of broke the rules there, lady. <laughs> uh, but in, you know, the Adam Sandler weird cadence. Uh, so I got so nervous in the middle of my set, I just ripped off that joke and got uh-huh. zero laughs. And I was like, ah, crap, this is really not right. going well. And then got auto pushed to the next round. Uh-huh. And then this was the worst part was I actually made the finals. Like yeah, I yeah. got my stuff, my uh, stuff together. And she, I was like, uh, I made, well, no, I made the semifinals. And then mm-hmm. when I went, she like, I got an email about it and I was like, wait, the finals are the same night as the, se- like we we're doing our round of semifinals and the finals that night and it was in front of the same audience so i went and did the semifinals, uh uh-huh. advanced to the finals with like six comics and it was the same crowd an hour later like, ha- right. like it was like we took an intermission and i was like i only have eight minutes of jokes i don't have another eight minutes really? <laughs> like like i've only been doing this two months like i have like i spent all of my jokes on that and i just had to like right. ad lib Eight minutes, like my finals did not go well. It was real oh bad. Oh my god, uh, that uh, that reminds me of a show I did in Hagerstown, Maryland. Like Ooh. maybe six months in, it was at a bar that you know, obviously there's not a cover, but mm-hmm. that night there was a cover. I think it was like twenty dollars or something. Like Whoa! That. I don't recall getting paid for this show either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I do, I do the first show and bomb miserably because I'm doing trying to do like you know smart Dimitri mm, yeah, Martin yeah, style yeah, kind yeah. of jokes. And then look at my pie chart. <laughs> yeah, and then I did the se- and then the second show. I just decided to to uh, the second. I kind I guess I kind of took the advice of the of someone because uh, uh, it was with um, my friend Alex Powers and Sean Savoy, I believe. And they just kind of told me to make be aggressive at the crowd. Uh-huh. So I went up and I said uh, I just insulted them for a few minutes and I said, oh, they- "Oh, the the bar is near the high school." which is near the prison. So it's the place everyone starts and then two places you fuckers end up. Uh-huh. And they liked and that. And they probably crushed it. And, yeah, they, and they liked yeah. that. But then I couldn't continue that, so yeah, I yeah, just I had to go crap. back and do the yeah. same <laughs> one-liners I just did oh. for the same people. Oh, um, man. I do. Oh, my God. That's God. one thing I really miss from, like, I hate, I don't miss the driving, like having to drive two hours to like go to some VFW where uh-huh. it's like I had, I had one show once. I remember I drove, it wasn't too bad. It was like an hour out to this VFW and it was a little league fundraiser. Uh huh. And I get there and the guy who like, uh, hired me was like, Hey, uh, I'm not sure how many people are going to show up for this because the, there was a fist fight at the little league game today between the president and the vice president of the league. So there was like a huge, <laughs> they were supposed to have this big fundraiser that night. And, but like, a huge divide grew uh-huh. that day like a, a squabble broke out so it was like a half full place and i felt so bad i was uh opening and there was another comic the guy who booked me was featuring but then the headliner was a dirty hypnotist 
who was the uh, son. He was the son of another. Like this guy was a famous dirty hypnotist who toured all over New England, mm-hmm. and he was this guy's son. I feel like I've I know who you're Nick, talking Nick about. Nick Santos. If that sounds and so familiar. Santos Junior yeah. is his son. Yeah, and uh, he told me I did I did my set and it went okay. And then, because I had a ton of Little League jokes at the time, so those yeah, went yeah. well. And then while, while the other comic was up, I was talking to him, and he started telling me how he was worried that he wouldn't be able to find someone to hypnotize because the crowd was so small. It's like one out of 30 people or something actually can be hypnotized, and there's uh-huh. only like 25 people there. He was like, I might have zero act. Like, if I yeah, can't yeah. hypnotize any of these people, there's nothing to do. And I luck- I kind of wish I had stayed now, cause, uh, but I left. Uh-huh. I was like, I can't handle, especially... Back then, I would do all these uh, road gigs where I'd like open or feature for some comic who is like 55 and hasn't written a new joke in 20 years. Who right. did? He did. He might have been on late night in 1992 or something like that, and now just tours New England and gets paid yeah. 300 dollars a pop for a Friday night. And I would just right, watch their right. most painful old comedy, and it would be after I would do like more like modern interesting stuff and not do well and they'd go mm-hmm. up and tell the hackiest jokes about getting duis and stuff and just crush and yeah. i'd be like i can't watch this i gotta get out of here i've done yeah i've done so many of those shows but Ugh. i i feel always better to bomb on your own terms than to yeah exactly than sell out uh, than to succeed doing stuff that you don't personally feel connected to i had an epic uh like you were talking about that hagerstown bar yeah, yeah. i did i was doing one in seabrook new hampshire and it was this like quasi biker bar that they ran it was like a monthly contest where i wasn't much it was like best comic got like 50 or 100 bucks or something Mm -hmm. and i did it one month and it was their first month doing it and there was a bunch of people at the bar who were not there for comedy being really loud i went up first Mm -hmm. and just struggled through my entire set nothing was working because they were like talking over blah blah blah. right right. then the hosts go up or the host goes up uh, after me and announces how they're opening the back bar so anyone who's not here for comedy go hang out in the back bar so they all leave and then the show ends up being great and this yeah, yeah. comic who I knew I was way better than won that night and I was like well fuck you I'm coming back here so I came back in a, a few months later and I'd been watching a little too much Zach Galifianakis uh-huh. uh, stand up at that point where he is not afraid to just get real loud and like that fake anger he has that's yep. so funny mm-hmm. uh and it was his live at the Purple Onion where he like yelled. He does some great crowd work. And, oh yeah, and, like yells at some people, and then like one guy like describes his job, and he just gets like, he gets like a painful look, and he's just like, oh god, you're so boring, like just like <laughs> yeah. so perfect. Yeah. And so I went that night when I showed up. I was like in my mind, I was like, you know what? If they're loud and talking, I'm gonna like do something about it. I'm gonna shut this place up. Yeah. I go up, start doing my set, and there's this dude like 20 feet, uh, like in front of the stage, right. Uh huh just loudly hitting on this woman right, just right. like so loud and i like conti- i like continue uh try to ignore him and he's still like being so eventually i just like walk off the stage like i just kind of run up and he's right behind this couch i jump on the couch and start yelling at him to shut the hell up I'm uh-huh. like would you see what i'm trying to do here shut up shut up shut up and then he just go- he looks at me and goes sit down you're done it's over and i look over i look over at the judges and he was like uh sit down that was the owner of the bar <laughs> Oh my god. I ran up, we got right in the owner's face and told him to shut the fuck up. I'm trying to do comedy here. So my set was just over. It was like two minutes into my set and he's like, Nope, you're done. Sit down. Uh and so I went and sat and I was like near the front hanging out with a buddy who I drove drove there with. And I uh-huh. didn't know at, like while we were sitting there, a bunch of the biker dudes like were like kind of like conglomerating and trying to decide sure. like, are we gonna beat up this little punk who just yelled at the, like the guy who owns our bar? Yeah. And luck and I didn't see this. We left before it was over, and mm-hmm. the bouncer stopped like two or three dudes from following us out into the parking lot. Which Jesus. I, yeah, I was like, are you kidding me? Like, and also I'm 135 pounds. Like, yeah. Why are there two or three of you? What What's the plan here? And that night, and right at the end, I missed it because we had left. A crazy windstorm had uh, like blew through uh-huh. and knocked the power out. Right when they announced the winner, they're like, and the uh-huh. winner of the show is blah blah blah. I can't remember. It was like Chris Cameron or something. Uh-huh. Then the power goes out, and a, mm-hmm. a bunch of the comics didn't realize I had left. So the right. power went out for 30 seconds, and then kicks back on, and I and then they're like. Where'd Brad go? Right. <laughs> they thought I got like scooped up during like someone turned the lights off and just sure, like scooped sure. Brad out of there. Just got gotcha. Yeah. Like I had one of them called me and was like, dude, are you okay? Where are you? I was like, uh-huh. yeah, I'm fine. I'm driving home. And he was like, 
oh, I thought the bikers, like, and I was like, what do you mean the bikers? And they were really mad. That's when I was like, all right, no more Zach Galifianakis style. Right. <laughs> Anger it did not work. But man, I hate, I'm so glad I never had to go back to that place. Yeah. Oh. And then oh. what, and then what brought you to New York? Uh, I basically, like, I was doing comedy. I kind of got fed up with, like, doing the road stuff. Like, I was making money but doing a lot of shows where it like wouldn't really go that well. Right. Uh, and then I'd watch, you know, the 50 year old comic crush it with uh-huh. like poop jokes. Yeah. And also, I, there was a girl in New York who I actually, the girl who I, I what, had dated on my mission. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank God for her. And, but we'd like, we'd been, hadn't been together for like 10 years probably at that point, but I was still like, yeah, someone I know in New York at least. And then I had a friend who was in grad school, uh, who had just graduated and he was moving to New York and it was just kind of like one of those like, eh, why not? Like I'll try it uh-huh. type things. And I was miserable for like the first 12 hours, I think, uh-huh. like initially. I moved in to the East Village and my bedroom was so small, I couldn't have my bed in its frame and still open the door. Oh, man. Like having that little Ikea frame that adds uh-huh. like two inches per side made it mm-hmm. so I couldn't open my door. So that whole year, I just had my bed frame in pieces in the corner and my mattress on the floor. Oh, wow. And it didn't have a closet. Right. So, but I had like 12 foot tall ceilings. So I put a curtain rod up on the ceiling and hung all my clothes up and had to use a hook on a pole to get my clothes up and down <laughs> for that first year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. did not, I did not have a lot of second dates that year. Like yeah. they would be like, Hey, let's go back to my place. And they wake up in the morning and they're just like, what the hell am I doing with my life? Right. <laughs> <laughs> or you, do you want to get breakfast? Let me just get my shirt down here and I'll get oh, dressed. <laughs> oh my God. I, I am reminded so much of my first apartment in Sunset Park that also did not have a, a closet. So I just, but there was like an old drying rack that the previous tenant had left. So I just threw all my shirts on that. And I put my pants and underwear into a cardboard box <laughs> and, and I still, I still had sex in that room. Yeah, I know. That's what was crazy. Every time I was like, like, that's a good moment to realize too. Cause you think, I remember in college, uh-huh. whenever you go to a party and stuff, you like, like you clean your room, make your clean room nice and clean beforehand, like make yeah. your bed and stuff like like that's going to be the difference. Like mm-hmm. like you've already yeah, done all I the work the mo- to get a girl back there and she's going to be like, "Ugh, your room's a mess. I'm out of here." Like no, yeah. that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, I I was I was doing the best I I could, but I'm I'm glad that things are I'm I am glad I'm not still there. Yeah. Um I I I you know, cuz that's that stuff is all fun for a while and then mm-hmm. eventually you get to a point where you're like, "Okay, this this like this isn't quite working for me. This is affecting my mind. Yeah. So I, I need, need to, I need to make some changes so that I can continue to pursue my dream. Mm-hmm. What well, kind of miss living in the East village? Mostly like it was miserable, but it was a much better motivator. Cause it was me and four roommates uh-huh. who were all really cool, but it was a tiny apartment. Like right, we, right. we hung out a lot on the weekends and stuff, but basically it was, like as soon as they started to get home from work, I was like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go do open mics or shows, whatever. And in Manhattan, there's so much comedy everywhere. I didn't even like own, I didn't even buy a subway pass for the first like six months. Cause you just walk uh-huh. everywhere, which is also really good for writing. Yep. Like putting in the miles. Uh, so I would just write a ton. I was doing comedy like 10 times a week. It was mm-hmm. like just basically just to not be home at the same time as my roommates. Where now I have what's basically my own apartment. It's like a s- separate basement room with its own entrance. That's like a studio. Right, right. Uh, and huge. I like, it's so hard to get motivated to go out. Like I get home from work, sit down and I'm like, ugh. Like even if it's like, there'll be a show five blocks away from me. And I'm just like, yeah, but I'm home and I'm, it's, I'm fine. Like why do I, I don't need to do that. Yeah, I'm I'm at the I'm at the point where I'm much I'm trying to work smarter about my stage time. Of course, if I was having really nice book shows every night, I feel I would of course prefer, prefer yeah, that. Yeah. But when I am doing stand up, I'm enjoying it much more. And you know, I feel I I just there's a certain not that not that I feel much older than other people who are doing mm-hmm. open mic comedy, but I just I don't have the patience yeah, for I, for these kids. Anymore. I tried like probably six months ago. I hadn't been to an open mic. Actually, I probably did like one or two at Pine Box just because mm-hmm. that's a place I've been to you know hundreds of times and very comfortable. Uh, 
and and I like that bar, so I don't mind just hanging out there I, for I a like little that while. Room. I've done my one man show. Yeah. There. Oh yeah, I saw your one man show there. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Great. Yeah, uh, that's right. I remember you. Uh, the I went to uh, was it Alligator Lounge, whatever the Williamsburg one is. I can't remember if it's Alligator or Crocodile, but I went. Yeah, like, I know what you're talking about. It was a random Tuesday or something. I was like, wait, I think they still have an open mic there, so I just like stopped in. Within 20 minutes, I was like, I want to kill myself. This is so bad, and I I waited like two hours to do my two minutes everyone else had left at that point and it was just like this is so pointless which is a big i think a big part of it like instead of spending three hours at an open mic to do two minutes if you spent that three hours just writing if you spent that three hours just like in front of your mirror pacing back and forth you're going to progress more than you are at that open mic yeah i definitely hit you definitely hit a point of diminishing returns like it's important to do that early on but Mm -hmm. i feel like more to like meet people yeah yeah and then also just get physically comfortable with the act of standing mm-hmm. on the stage with a microphone and talking yeah. in front of people. And yeah, and it gives you some understanding of what is and isn't funny. Like you want to you want to get to the point where you can write and it's not always true. You'll sometimes write a joke you think is the funniest thing ever and no one will ever laugh at it. Mm-hmm. I've had that happen. Uh and but you reach a point where you should know if it's going to work. Like you when you write it you're like, "Ooh, all right, that's a good joke. You don't really yeah. need to go to an open mic in front." And also when you do two minutes of comedy or even like th- like three, four minutes, there are some, like you can try some humor that mm-hmm. isn't going to work where if you're doing 20 minutes, it'll crush 15 minutes in. There's mm-hmm. if, if you've established who you are and everyone in the audience is more on board with your persona and character, you yeah. can tell like the more extreme jokes and they're going to, like you can slowly build up to them. Mm-hmm. Where if you just have a two minute open mic or you're doing like some bar show that's like an ambush show and only you only get six minutes you can't just jump into like the crazy sex jokes or like the crazy Mm -hmm. blue stuff right away totally because they're gonna be like who are you what is all this about they gotta like you first yeah yeah where if you if you're given actual time man you can you can that's the best i miss that about like 20 30 minute sets when when it's you they're so in tune Mm-hmm. With your cadence and stuff, they start laughing at like the non punchline parts just right. because, like, that's like every time you take a break, they like it's just a reflex at that point. They just exactly, start you got the you got the groove kind of yeah, going. Yeah. Um, oh, it feels so nice. Yeah, you know, abs- absolutely. That's why that's why I love the storytelling community because you can kind of establish that groove quicker because mm. it's just a more in tuned kind of. I've been thinking about. Audience. I need to try. I should get some uh, storytelling spots from you because I've been trying to do a one man show about the whole growing up Mormon and leaving Yo, the church thing. I was hoping that you were because yeah. there is a lot to yeah. mine from that. And the, yeah, and but it's definitely more story mode uh-huh. than like stand up mode. Right. Well, other than Jake Hart's on Tuesdays at the at the creek, um, David Lawson, who was my first guest on this show, uh, has a. A monthly storytelling show at the Astoria Bookshop. I think it's it's either the fourth. It, I believe it's the fourth Thursday. Okay. Um, if he listens to this, he can tell me what the right date is. Did, but did you ever go to the Waltz Astoria up here when they were when that was a thing? It was like I had like weird riding my bike up here was like deja vu. City. Oh yeah. I used to because I would like bomb up twenty first all the way to Waltz Astoria, like trying not to get killed by cars, and because they had. I uh, I spent so much time there one summer because they had like Tuesday and Wednesday nights. You spent ten dollars on their terrible food and drink, like it'd be like a six dollar cucumber sandwich or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you would get ten minutes. I yeah, I remember that place. I don't know if I ever made it up there because it was kind of a hike from Sunset Park. Oh yeah, that's way. Um, and ten dollars I think was outside of my my budget during <laughs> those days. Um, I spent a lot of time at the now closed Rapture Lounge. Uh, oh, okay. Near Thirtieth Avenue. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the NW and I also what what there was one there was one other unusual spot that I I used to do I think I might have done a set at this like black box theater that's not the creek but near the creek oh interesting um so that's kind of where I was and then my really formative spots when I first moved to New York where it was a place called the Perch Cafe in Park Slope. Oh, okay. Which was on Sundays, and it was like music, co- comedians. That's the a, thing. That's what was Walt, a, Waltz was, music and comedy, and those were the best mics when I first moved to the city because they give, even though it'll be like musicians, you get two songs, comedians, you get like 10 minutes. Sometimes musicians do like 20 minutes because it's 
two, yeah. two songs they wrote and they uh-huh. don't know how to be concise yet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I would also do the Lucky Jacks Thursday night. Was it Thursday nights? Yeah, I used to do Thursdays. that with Frolix all the time. Oh, where yeah. It was Sasha's thing who was just... <laughs> if, 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 oh, man. He was a hippie who worked at a library in Hoboken and aspiring mm-hmm. like loop musician. So just picture that. That is Sasha yeah. to the T. Mm-hmm. And that was the mic where he would draw, you sign up, then they draw names and you like decide where you want to go. Yeah. And when I lived, it was the best when I lived in the East Village because I would go to that mic and if I got, because that mic would go from like 8 to like 2 a.m. Uh-huh. And so if I, because it would always be like, they'd go from like 8 to 10, 10 30 and then have like a feature performer which could be a c- comedian or some musician with it would be all over like i remember seeing yeah. some weird like japanese like not k-pop it was like a japanese like boy band basically oh really it was j- they were like visiting new york and did a crazy thing i saw uh i don't remember what the african instrument is that's the giant gourd that they put strings on I, I know what you're talking yeah, about, but I, I don't know the name of it. I watched some jam out so hard for 45 minutes one night. I used to get super high and just be like, this is the weirdest, most New York shit possible. Yeah. But with that mic, I would, when they draw names, I'd either sign up to go before the 1030 guy, uh-huh. and then I would stick around, or I knew I'd be way after that, and I would just go home or mm-hmm. go to another mic, go get dinner, and then I'd just show up at 11 or like 1 a.m. and get my spot, and if... You would go later, which sucked, but Sasha would always be super drunk by that point. Yeah. And would just, if you were d- doing well, he would just basically forget to light you. So you could do like 15 minutes and feel great about it. And he's like, wow, I just did more time tonight than I did the last five nights. Oh, wow. And that was, and I, those nights I spent like 10 hours at open mics. Like it was, oh, that, that, sh- that room was great. Uh-huh. And it was, me, you meet a lot of people there. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which is how, half, half of it. Like I... Like so much of it is like even doing my sh- even doing my podcast now is like I have all of these relationships from time spent in the trenches mm-hmm. uh, that I really uh, that I'm really thank- thankful for now. I'm, o- I'm always thankful for that time. My uh, the most one of the most New York things I ever did. And this might be a good way to, to close this out. Close this out. Um, Victor Vernado's uh, oh, variety yeah, yeah. show used to be at the Bowery Poetry Club. And the first time I ever went there, a guy with a saxophone attached to a flamethrower played Old Ang Syne. And I could feel like the heat because the flame <laughs> shot like way out into the audience. And I'm just and like. Bowery Poetry Club was small. It was and really old. small and that very thing old. Was, that thing was flammable. And I'm just like, how do you walk? How have you? Walk? I mean, it's New York, so obviously you can walk through the streets and not attract any yeah, attention. Yeah. But I was just like. This is the epitome of what we're of of it all, really. And also, was he white? Uh, I don't remember. I don't think so, though. Oh, ooh, that is risky. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I remember seeing. I saw a black guy in Bushwick a few weeks ago who just walked down the street with an axe, mm. and I watched two police cruisers quickly zoomed up on him. But I like, I was watching and like I almost recorded because I'm like I'm I watch a lot of like film the police type videos like sure. police accountability. But I've also never had the sack to just do it because uh-huh. police don't like that. Uh, yeah. And I really wanted to because I was like, it's not illegal. Like, there's nothing illegal about having an axe in New York. It's like you can go because I've seen them at the hardware store. Like, you can go yeah. buy an axe. So why are you like you can you can just walk around with axes? Yeah. You t- or or oh, my God, I can't. I, I imagine I bet I know why there's no horror films shot in New York City, really. I've been in a couple, but they've been inside a warehouse. Oh, yeah. Um, because if you. Uh, your entire cast will get shot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It won't go well. Yeah. yeah, because that will be some suspicious looking shit. That's why there's lots of like romantic comedies, <laughs> lots of like you know young people, like a lot of dialogue heavy, heavy stuff. I feel is yeah. done independently in New York. Yeah. But... Woody Harrelson didn't write any horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or not Woody. Uh, Woody yeah. Allen. Yeah. 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 His his great his love letter to New York horror. <laughs> right. Um, so w- w- one more thing I want to ask you, what, uh, what is something comedically you haven't done yet that you want to do? And what do you think, uh, what are some mm. goals you've got comedy wise for the next year or huh. so? Well, the, the one man show is big. I like really need to, cause that's one of those things like I've started and dropped and started a bunch of times where uh-huh. I need to just like finish. And I was thinking about, I've taken a class. I know, uh, some other comics have like signed up and basically mm. it's, it's, 
something like that more is like it just creates a deadline, like a hard deadline, so you have yeah. to get it done. Um, uh-huh. So that would be really good. And then other than that, I mean, I'm not – I've reached the point where – I'm not trying, like, I'm not putting the effort in where I used to, like, going out every night and, like, trying. Because mm-hmm. I don't really see, because I've 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 had the dog walking company, and that is a much clearer path to financial yeah. stability and a future mm-hmm. than stand-up comedy. That's one thing you learn doing comedy in New York is you're like, you'll go to an open mic and some dude who's been on TV four times will show up. And you're just like, what are you doing here, man? Like, right. like why? It's so insane before, like when you're younger and you think anyone who's been on TV has just like made it. Right, right. And then you get here and you're like, oh wait, you've all been on TV. Like, uh-huh. and, and, you're, and none of you can pay your rent still. Like, oh yeah. Or, right. or even just like, or one of the impetus for like trying to really build up the podcast and become like, uh, my own sort of thing is that I asked about doing uh, a friend's show and she very politely uh, said that she can't get everyone on that she wants. And then I started seeing the lineups and I was like, Oh, I'm not famous enough. Yeah. 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 I haven't been on TV yet. So, yeah. and I know that's but not those, what she was saying, yeah. but it's, that's what I took from it. And that's where I was like, okay, well then I'll just get, but um, it's crazy how those, like comics on that show who are all on TV. I mean, I don't know your friend and her show, but they probably weren't paid for yeah. that show, which is one of the things I learned back home when I did that, when I first started and did that contest, one of the uh-huh. judges was like an old school Boston, New England guy. Yeah. And he told me uh, right after right after the contest, I think he was like, don't ever work for free on Friday or Saturday. Uh-huh. Like if you're doing a Friday or Saturday show, that booker is getting paid you need to get paid to. And I stuck to that. Mm-hmm. Like, and it was before I moved to New York, there was like a Friday show I was supposed to do at like a venue I'd done a bunch. And I called the girl who was booking it. And I was like, wait, are you, cause she wasn't paying anyone. I was like, are you getting paid for the show? And she was like, well, yeah, but I need the money for like, gave some excuses about why she needed the money. I was like, yeah, I was like, you yeah, know, I, I understand, but I need to get some of that money too. And she like, wouldn't give me any, and I was like, all right, I'm not doing your show and just said no. And then mm-hmm. I'd been, this was, oh man, this is a great moment of realizing what I had done when I moved to New York. Yeah, yeah. I'd been in New York like a month and a half maybe and used to always go to, I don't know if it still even exists, O'Hanlon's on uh-huh. 15th Street. And they, uh, uh, oh, what's his, what's his face I right on the it, mic there? I think it, 15th, wasn't it like 15th and like 1st Avenue or something? Yeah, like yeah, that? or 14th. I think it was 14th, yeah, because yeah, it was yeah, a two-way. That bar still exists, but they don't do comedy anymore. Yeah, yeah, they changed, they, I was, I used to, I was still doing comedy there when they kicked the comedy out and made it a pool room. They just like, they're like, yeah, no, yeah. no, we'll make more money if we just put pool tables back there. Yeah, to be they fair, had, they're not wrong. Yeah, that's true. They had, I can't remember his name, but he ran the open mic there and charged, it was $5.00 to get on the list and uh-huh. he ran it like Tuesday, Wednesdays and Fridays and made probably like 150 to 200 dollars every time and this was the best part is he would raffle off uh comedy albums mm. like as prizes but they were comedy albums he burned off his computer. Yes, I so, have one. Yeah, yeah, I had I won like Jim Norton's like things I made from Gorilla's fingers or whatever it is. So uh-huh. this guy is taking open mic comics money five dollars at a time and then pirating professional comics uh material to like hand out to the open mic comics as like an, a reward and i was like man you were just fucking yeah. everyone on both ends this is yeah. ridiculous that, that's when that's when you realize that you know there's being paid to do comedy in new york yeah. there's a, a dark side yeah. to that well also. the uh so yeah so i was doing that show for a while or like hanging out there a lot and i'd been mm-hmm. there like a month a month and a half and one of the com, i was like at the bar after and one of the comics came up and was like oh hey man you're great you want to do i run this uh saturday night show at this place uh blah, uh-huh. blah, blah. and i was like yeah sure i'd love to uh what's it pay and he just laughed right like he just like he thought it was the like he thought i was making a joke and thought my timing was like perfect and great and i was uh-huh. just like uh oh okay oh nothing all right i'm glad i figured that out mm-hmm. and there is no money in this and it was also i'm not I, uh it was that same place used to have a big they had a very big show uh called hot soup it's moved a bunch of times and changed names i think since then mm-hmm. i don't want to say who the comic is because he's like legit legit big time now mm-hmm. and i remember i would go there and do that show sometimes then just like hang out because it's right around the corner from my apartment mm-hmm. and it was after the show 
And I'd been hanging out at the bar for a few minutes. The show ended and the host came out and we were like talking. And there's this beer that was next to me at the bar that had been abandoned. It was like three quarters of the way full. Uh-huh. And he just goes, hey, man, is, is that your beer? And I was like, no. He was like, Do you, is that? And I was like, I don't think it's anyone's. He just went, all right. And just grabbed it and was drinking uh-huh. that abandoned beer. And this was a comic who like everyone was like, this guy's great. He's he's like he's super successful and crushing it in New York. And I was like, he's drinking abandoned beer. <laughs> he is not crushing it by and like the standards we have for crushing it, which yeah. is just. And also, why are you drinking it? Like you put on a show at this place that sells out every week. The back room is packed. They should be giving you all the beer you want. And mm-hmm. it was like, and that was where the reason no one was getting, no one gets paid. I think in the city is no one negotiates with the bar to get money. Right. I ran a show. I mean, I'm guilty of it too, just because it's like the standard in New York. I ran a show out of the Grizzly Pear for like five years uh-huh. that we would pack that place out. We'd sell out at least half the time, like no room. Oh, that's a thousand dollar bar tab. Like that's a thousand dollar alcohol sales, easy. Yeah, because it's a two drink, quasi two drink minimum. Because they're not really good at serving there. Right. Uh, right. And we couldn't we couldn't get a dollar out of the the owners of that place. Which and now and then they just flipped after Crashing came out and Grizzly Pear. Uh-huh. Like became more famous, which is hilarious because on crashing it's like the shithole, right? And but they took advantage of that and they're like, "As seen on HBO," <laughs> and mm-hmm. turned it into the Grizzly Pear Comedy Club and just kicked out everyone that was booking all their shows there and just like turned it over to one guy to like book wow. everything. And I was oh like, my "All God. right," I was like, "Great, thanks, thanks, New York, uh, you're the best." Yeah, New York, it, it is. I I feel like you view it as the gym and then uh, you view it as a gym and then also there's plenty of places where you can create opportunities for yourself. So we'll talk about your one man show uh, because, you know, I'm I'm still, you know, always doing my show periodically. So oh, nice. If uh, me and Sam Zeltik, uh, Sam Z just did this where like he would open for me and then I would open for him and mm-hmm. we each person gets a chance to like do a longer set depending yeah. on, on where it's done and so we could we could find time to. It. It's crazy how hard it is to get longer times in New, in York. New York. Like, did you have do you ever hear the story about how Nick Schwartzen got his first Comedy Central half hour? No. He because he lived in New York. I mean, he was like a phenom and got it when he was like twenty one or twenty two or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But he had lived in New York and couldn't get a half hour of stage time anywhere mm-hmm. to like do his whole set. So he recorded it like by himself on an audio recorder, just his whole thing, and like would just like put in like. And then this is where the audience goes crazy. And like, <laughs> and it was just him. And that's what got him his half hour. That's the tape he had to submit because oh, wow. he couldn't actually get 30 minutes anywhere. And you see it every, whenever the time of year when it's like tape time for the right, Comedy right. Central half hour, you see all the comedians posting like, hey, anyone got any time? Blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, no one has. Yeah, this is how far, uh, this is how far I am detached from, from that shit. It's like, I never even really think, notice when that's happening. Oh, yeah. Because I'm just always trying to do that anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's so funny when all of a sudden you'll see people's like events will just be like, Julie and and Lisa do doing, 30 minutes, do their 30 minutes and it's like there's that's like the first time they've ever been able to do 30 minutes yeah, <laughs> yeah. so it's so bizarre um dude this has been great this has been Th- yeah. this this has been really awesome so um so we're we're gonna do some more stuff and I'm gonna do your show soon what is some stuff we can plug before we get out uh well uh I have a monthly at precious metal it's called big darkness we just had our mm-hmm. five year anniversary, which was like congrats. That's my, awesome. I can't like I uh, I did not believe my co host when he said five years for like a week. I was like, dude, it can't be. This is wrong. And then I went to book one of the comics uh-huh. and like went back through my Facebook messages and I was like, oh, he was on our first show five years ago. All right, this is <laughs> this is actually accurate. Uh, yeah. So that uh, if anyone needs dog walker uh, scratches and wags dot com is my company. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. You're a business owner as well. Uh, yeah, I know, which is, uh, that's been more of a, it's so weird how I moved to New York for stand-up comedy and just like fell into the dog walking thing. Mm-hmm. And that just like exploded on its own into this like whole another world where I have like employees and stuff. And uh-huh. I was just like, how did this? And that was just like word of mouth. I didn't even do anything. That's wild, man. Yeah, and it was like, it would have been nice if that happened in comedy, where it's just <laughs> word of mouth, <laughs> oh, and all of a sudden everyone know. knows who you are, yeah. Oh, God, if only if only it was that easy. But we're going to work on it. And uh, cool, man. So we'll, and, uh, cool, so we'll work on that, and I'll, we'll probably be at another NYCFC game yeah, before, I hope so. before too long. I want to I see Zlatan really bad. Well, I'll, if, if, uh, if, 
I might go. He's in Jersey this weekend, and I'm thinking oh, about him. they're playing the Red, Red Bulls. Bulls. Yeah, and I yeah, think he's go playing. to that yeah, one. I, I, I need to because he gets injured a lot. I think. Well, he's he's yeah, a little he's, bit older. It's now would be the time getting, to see him. Yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. Cool, man. So let me know how that goes, and uh, thanks for, for sure. doing this. Man. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate I it. it. All right. I didn't know we were going to talk about any of that when he sat down, but I'm so glad that Brad was uh, so willing to, to discuss uh, his background with me. And I'm glad that he's in a, in a good place and I'm going to be doing his show uh, before long, or I might have already done his show by the time you hear this. Uh, so thank you guys again for checking out my podcast. If you want to leave a review on iTunes or add us to your favorite playlist on Stitcher, that helps uh, spread the word about the show because I'm just trying to create my own little uh, niche here on the internet, my own little uh, community, and I'm hoping to be able to get to travel, do some stand-up comedy in your city soon. If you, basically, I will play anywhere in the, in the world as long as there are people there that want to that wanna see me. So if you enjoy this or you've seen my stand-up, my, uh, my joke about the chopped cheese sandwich, for example, and you want to hear more jokes about food, music, and absurd thoughts that I have when I should be being productive uh let me know that there's demand for my stand-up in your city and i will come and uh perform for you so thank you guys again so much for listening and i will see you next week between awesome and disaster take care everybody (laughs) 